that's the easiest way to do it, and feel free to do so. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, oh no, you keep talking. This is how I we come think... in. We we come in hot. Like Good. honestly, while you stepped There's away, no other way. Exactly. There's no other way. When you stepped what away, point? Gary and I were actually discussing the threshold for with which you will remove a bug and still drink your drink. We were discussing under what oh, yeah. circumstances. No, I... <laughs> that won't happen. No, not for you. But we were discussing <laughs> under what circumstances have we gone like, eh, then just kind of get that gnat off your drink somewhere and you just look around and kind of go on with it. <laughs> no, you see, the problem is, is that now on TikTok, they show all these crazy videos of like what that does to you. So now I, in the past, I would have just drank it. <laughs> but oh, now that no. I know from all these TikTok videos, I'm like all paranoid. Yeah, yeah, I feel like good. our entire childhood was a lie. Like everything oh, about everything we've ever heard. I want to go back to my childhood. I want to <laughs> well, go back, please. Right? It was much simpler. I rode in the back of the station wagon. Oh, no the back of the belt, truck. Drank out of a hose. <laughs> yeah. I was just thinking that drink out we, of the rusty hose. And oh, side. man, I got oh, all my man. vitamins and minerals out of a hose. And by the way, <laughs> tell me this. Was it your... You your thirst was quenched when you drank out of that hose. That was the yeah, best. That, that was like you taste? couldn't get enough of that water. Yeah. <laughs> no, you would blow your cheeks out with it. You would do all sorts of stuff. Just sit there and gulp like, until so like your stomach you hurt. Drinking it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, well, it's the best water ever. <laughs> I agree. You heard that here. The best water ever. Welcome to the Tragedy Academy, a right show created to bridge societal divides in a judgment free zone using candor and humor. And today we are joined by Deborah Driggs, and I got Gary in studio as well. Gary, what's going on today, man? Hey, living life. About to go get some of that uh, garden hose water after we were talking about it. Maybe we can make a cocktail with that as one of the ingredients. Yeah. I think, honestly, it might have a nostalgic flavor to it. That slight tinge of tang of metal and rubber. Yeah. It just has that. that... It's fresh water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, it's I'm from fresh Cleveland. water. <laughs> well, you can't get like this bottled water is nonsense. Like the, it's fresh water, right? By the mm. way, if you've ever been to Italy, you walk around Italy and they have fountains that you can literally just go up to and drink out of. Oh yeah, <laughs> we've taken it to street. pretty pretty extreme measures to place <laughs> as many human hands on our consumables as possible before it hits us. Like we have yes. invented. A fucking circus of things that happen to our food and drink before it Absolutely. hits our hands. For people that don't want other exactly. people messing with their stuff that claim to be healthy, like we let everybody mess with our shit when it comes out of a hose, or it's like there's a farm right there. It's so funny. Remember when we were kids, we would drop our apple on the ground and pick it up and continue eating it. Now I hear parents go, Don't eat that. Like, I'm like, What are you kidding? Now it's got some minerals, it's got some added value. Yeah, I've had we grit in my teeth. I thought that was like the other way. I thought that was common. Everybody knows what sand in their teeth feels like, right? That's in the first five years yeah. of your life. You've gritted down on a probably an inordinate amount of sand. Now that I think about it, come on! <laughs> if you didn't have a picnic sure. on the beach and you didn't drop food in the sand and go, oops, oh well. Oh yeah, it makes yeah. that hot dog yeah. nice and crunchy. Yeah, I miss my childhood so much because those were the days when we walked around. We were we were doing what everybody's paying to do now, which is grounding. We just we walked around barefoot. We drank out of a hose. We had fun. We weren't worried about everything. Is just such a big deal now. Everything is thinking about anything but now. So I just want to make sure that I introduce you correctly, everybody. This is Deborah Driggs. <laughs> some girl. <laughs> and, and yeah, it comes you with... You got some girl today. Right? Uh, we're super professional here. Hot. Tragedy in the name. But Deborah Driggs actually um, on a healing path. I love that moniker that you have for what you're doing. Um, has been an actress. What? Night Rhythms, Total Exposure, Neon Bleed, um, Playboy Centerfold, and Cover Girl. And you're a member of the Screen Actors Guild and a top-rated insurance professional. Yeah, how does that happen? I, yeah, I was wondering where that you one know? came from. Yeah, I like that. You know, I'm the queen of reinvention. And, you know, when it, you, when things get rough, you reinvent. and Adapt you know, and overcome. That I was, nobody cared that I was on the cover of Playboy three times when I was 40, broke, and had three kids to feed. You know, nobody cared. It wasn't like... People forget oh, about the, that. Okay, well... Yeah, exactly. They don't realize that um, 
a few minutes in front of a camera or in the, you know, the public's eye does not equate to a lifetime's payout. People think that once you've been on a camera or a screen that you must have like this check that's going to last you forever. And it's no. so and wrong. That's, that's why you see. Yeah, that's why you see. And by the way, that's part of my downfall was, you know, first of all, my first addiction was attention. I came out like, man, can you relate going? Yeah, it's all today. about me. All eyes on right here, right? You know, my first addiction, attention. So there was no accident that I ended up in a profession that it was always about me. Like I walked into a room and it, everybody, you know, so dad, what are you doing now? No, no, it was always attention here. But it got to a place in my life where then it turned into alcohol mm. and it turned into other addictions because when one addiction stops working, it transfers to another one. So here I am, 40, divorced, broke, and my alcoholism just goes skyrocketing because there's no more attention. Even though I was still doing commercials, I was hosting a morning show, but I was miserable on the inside. And people mm. would, you know, when I would share that with people, you know, they their first thing would be, really? Because you always look like you have it so together. And I was suffering so much. They need you and, to. That's what nobody will admit. Yeah. They want you yeah. and need you to have your shit together because yeah, they've been modeling. Falling apart. What, no, they've been modeling themselves after you. We put yeah. so much stock in what other people's capabilities are, and we'll transfer their success under our own fucking success. If they're not making it, there ain't no way I can make it. So when they're looking at you and you're telling them you're not making it, they're going, no, nah, you're making it. Come on. Yeah. Because then they have yeah. to admit themselves, I might not be making it either. Yeah. Or looks, it's, too. It's, like, oh, she's uh, so pretty. She must be fine. Oh, yeah. Well, well, that was the other thing. So, <laughs> yeah. So here I was 40 and I had to. So the first thing I did was real estate. And then 2008 happened. And then I had to reinvent myself again. And so I got into life insurance and I had a lot of big success. I had more success in life insurance than in acting and modeling. I believe yeah, okay. So financially, I had more success doing, I was in the top 1% of the industry. I worked for one of the biggest brokers in the United States and I was licensed with everybody. So I wasn't captive. I wasn't a, a captive mm. agent. I, I was licensed Even with everybody. Better. Yep. And so, so I, and I would, some of these companies, I was their number one agent. I wasn't captive to them. So they would be like, who's this Deborah Gaylord? Cause I use my legal name for that. And they're, who's this Deborah Gaylord? You know, how did she come up the ranks? But you know, because I was looking at the products for my clients, not by not trying to sell one product like a captive agent would do. So I had a lot of success. And through that, I realized that one, I was smart. And two, I was I was a good business person. Like I understood networking. And, you know, I've always, I've always, like if I told people, oh my God, I'm using this, this great product, everybody would buy it. And so that just kind of transferred over into insurance. I actually really believed in the product I was selling. I think that's the first step when you're a charisma. You it, have to believe in what you're selling. And People believing smell in your, it. And believe, yeah, they totally do. So, you know, and firm and, believer. And I, I had fun selling real estate because I loved, I loved that time in my life. But when the market took a dive, my market was the first to go. Mm. And so then I had to start over again. So when I got into insurance, then that led me into investing and learning. I, like I now I'm excited about this financial life that I never had as a as a successful actress model. I never even thought about where to put my money. I was just spending, spending and doing all that. You know, I was it like takes a money just to stay in that lifestyle. The yeah, clothes where, and going where to the smart, and... right. You see the smart actors and models that they they take the success and they rebrand. Kathy Ireland is the best example of it. She was one of the most beautiful models in the 80s and 90s, still is to this day. But she was the smart one. She rebranded and created a multi-billion dollar business. And so that's who I look at and go, how did they do that? How did, you know, I aspire to that. You know, I look at them as the role model of a successful somebody who had success in the 80s and 90s as a model, but then said, okay, what am, what am I going to do when I get into my 50s and 60s 
how you know what how can i rebrand this you only know She's when you know that. that's the thing yeah. what people don't realize is that yes you, I, i'm much like yourself i went through many different careers and reinvented myself over and over again what it taught me was that a i could do anything and b it's all bullshit um and that you can exactly it, it's it's the whatever days, you decide to be you to will school. be yeah all school does is train you to be an employee 100%. Right. Eight hours and then homework right. is it, it was it overtime. Trains you how to, right. It trains you how to line up, follow the rules, be an employee. It doesn't teach you how to be an entrepreneur. It doesn't teach Not you how to all. have your own business. Free thinking? It really sets you up to just follow the rules, have a pension, have benefits. You know, it's like all that stuff that we hear over and over again. And if when I go back and talk to my younger self, I'm like, no, no, hell no. No, no. You have your own business. You do this. You create. You keep creating and keep going until something hits. And that's where that's the the time we live in, which I find super exciting because there's a isn't it though everywhere now. It's super yeah, exciting. I was never a creator. Yeah, I was never a creator in my life. Um, I grew up, you know, without that as an option in my childhood. Kind of, I guess that's how you could put it. And as as an adult, I was you know in the army and then I did corporate stuff and all that kind of thing. And then there came a moment where I, I started creating and I felt like at that point in time, that was the moment I became myself. And that was the moment that I was operating at my full authentic, you know, capabilities. So I want to ask you, you have all these trials and tribulations. You, you know, you mentioned things like alcohol and addictions and, and things like that. A person like yourself that is successful and making an impact like you are has to have had a moment in time where they were on their knees and had to affect change within themselves. Can you tell us about maybe that moment or one of those moments that led you to the mindset that you have now? Yeah, it's a great question. And yeah, there were a few moments, you know, there's not, you know, for me, I've been on my knees a few times, you know, mm -hmm. and the one that stands out the most to me is after, you know, my alcoholism created a lot of damage. You know, I didn't, and by the way, I didn't know I was suffering from alcoholism. I just thought I was really depressed and I was really stressed out. And I would say things like that. I'm just, I'm just, I don't know. And I would, I really did not feel like myself. And I did not know that I suffered from the disease of alcoholism. I didn't know. So you don't know what you don't know, but it ruined a lot of things in my life. It ruined my marriage. It ruined, you know, my parenting went downhill. Um, I had a hard time reinventing. It took me a long time to pull myself out of that hole. But I can remember the exact moment I was in R.C. Willie in Salt Lake City. And I was going through this horrible divorce. And I didn't want the divorce. At the, now I'm panicking because I did not want the divorce. And I'm in R.C. Willie. And it was like everything hit me like a ton of bricks. And I fell to my knees in the department store hysterically crying. I was with my mother. And she's like, she didn't know what to do. You know, she's just like, you know, had no idea that she could get down on her knees with me and just be like, it's okay. You know, she didn't have that capacity and that's okay. That's who she is. But I literally fell apart and thank God we were near the, you know, the mattress section or whatever. I literally went and laid on one of the mattresses and pretended like I was like trying out the mattress. And I just remember I could not stop crying. And I thought this is that pivotal moment in my life where I knew I had to change. And I tell people this all the time. It wasn't in my success. And I've had a lot of great success in my life. It was in those moments of being on my knees where the growth mm -hmm. began, where all of a sudden there was something that shifted. And even though at the time it was so hard and it was so like, I just couldn't even think about how to take another breath of air, really, like breathing was difficult. And I just thought, well, here we go. Like, I got to really, I got to, it just hit me like, okay, I got to start over. And that mm. was the first time. And that was the first time. And I say, there's a lot of value in those times if you can make it through and stick around. You know, they say sticking around is the best revenge. I say this, sticking around means you've got some, you got some wounds, you got some scars, you know, and it's not about revenge. It's about sticking around to make a difference because I know mm. my story now is going to help some 40 year old mother out there with three kids that's going through the same thing because I'm not some exception to the rule. There's a lot of women out there right now that are struggling, that are trying to figure out ways to feed their kids or to take another breath of air. And if they're listening to my story, they're going, ah, I relate to that. And we all have that story. We all have that moment in time mm. where we 
we're brought to our knees for some reason. And it, 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 we either use it to do something better or we stay stuck. And I don't want to stay stuck anymore. You know, I'm now I recognize it more quickly. Like I know now when I'm starting to get pulled into, because it's mm. not, you know, it's a practice every day. I don't wake up every day, happy, joyous, and free. You know, it's like, no, there, life is life. Things are going to happen. Now I have a bigger toolbox. Back I love then that. when I was an RC Willie and I'm on my knees, I, my toolbox was empty. Uh, but, you, you know, know, I feel like much like a plant, it requires the ground for a seed to grow. And in order for us to grow, we also have to hit the ground. We're not going to be the best us if we're not grown from the ground up. We have to reinvent ourselves because everything that we know about ourselves is a fallacy. And in the moment when we hit the ground and we realize that all those things have no direct control over us, and it's actually how we perceive our position is the moment that we have power with which we can move from and affect change. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it is true. I mean, I look back, I'm going to be 59 this year. So I look back at some of the things in my twenties and thirties. And I, you know, I did have a lot of, I did a lot of commercials. I did a, I was on the cover of several magazines, not just Playboy. And I look back at that. It's like, I don't recognize that person. And there's a mm. reason for that because we are different. We do grow. And sometimes we have to go through this emotional journey to shift into the new, the new way we're going to be. We're not, and that's growing. That's, that, like you said, that's where the growth starts. You know, I think that was really the moment at RC Willie when I was like, I'm no longer this person. And now I have to reinvent. I'm not going to be Mrs. So-and-so. I'm not going to be, you know, it's like all of a sudden you realize that you're saying goodbye to a life or a part of yourself that is going to transform into something isn't, else. Isn't and that, that is, weird how that happens in our mind? Yeah, we mourn it, the loss of something that has no physical reality. It's not here. Yeah. It has no impact on us. But we will it's literally so hold a mental funeral of change. for the... That's exactly it. It's fear. It's a fear of Fear change. will make us hold on to an old persona and not be authentic. And the moment that you do hit your knees, you also get the ability to be yourself Without any interference, you get to go from the ground up without somebody else telling you the parameters of your existence anymore. You get yeah. to be authentic. We're made one it's way, so and to free. be anything different is a slap in the face of whomever or whatever made you. Simple as that. I Let me tell you, it's, it took me longer than some, but I really cared what you thought of me. I was real because of the business I was in and mm -hmm. because of being a model and all, I really cared what, you know, it's hard. It's like, I, I wish I, it would bounce off me, but it didn't. So I really cared. I don't anymore, thank God, because now I understand I have a completely different. Now when people say something or they have an opinion or a judgment, my first reaction now, because my toolbox is so much bigger, is, wow, they must be in a lot of pain. Bingo. And so, wow, you know, I don't take it personally. I know, by the way, things will come back to me oh, so-and-so said this, or, you know, and I just go, well, they must be, they must be suffering. Yeah. I get it. The internet, I mean, we didn't have to deal with that when we were younger, like it is now. I've actually worked for a Playboy as well for a short period of time. I work with a lot of actors, professional athletes, and people go out of their way to just tear them down every day, whether they're a champion or a beautiful person. There's people in their inbox or in their comments that are just saying the most awful things. And uh, I try to tell them, just don't look, you know, if you can't, process the good and push the bad away just don't look at don't all. give it life it's, no don't give it life and by the way and it's as soon as you respond it's like that's what they yeah, want yeah yeah some people think that you know I, I i follow grant cardone and i've actually i'm getting involved with him with real estate stuff and he says it you know perfectly like your haters they're there for a reason like they're following you and they're watching everything you do. That's the first sign you of success when somebody just, tries to tell exactly, you that exactly first sign exactly. of success. So yeah, so when people start trying to tear you down or try to have their, first of all, I love it when people have opinions about something they're not an expert in, <laughs> right? <All the> time. <laughs> so I, I'm always like, well, you have such a strong opinion about that, but you're not an expert in that field at all. <laughs> so, so you have to be careful who you listen to and take advice from. I always say to people, first of all, don't invest money with 
people who don't have it more money than you, number one. <laughs> and, you know, why would you Good do that? Thumb. That's crazy. Yeah. Or why yeah, would you take relationship? If your barber's got to eject a haircut, you go, you go to yeah, you're gonna go <laughs> He's person. got the mo. You don't go to it's him like, for your shape up. Yeah. <laughs> You listen to the opinions and the advice of people that have what you want, you know, and there's a lot of people out there giving all this advice. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, advice is a huge industry now. And it's a scary one to navigate. Can only imagine when you don't have the ability of, you know, the capability to discern between someone having a nefarious intent behind their advice or simply to gain money. And when someone's speaking from the heart. When they're pursuing their passion, shit, we lost her. She's like, I don't want to hear about your passion, Jay. Yeah, <laughs> fuck passion. <laughs> She'll be back. The internet in America, the saga, shitty internet. Well, this is perfect. I'll just stick a fucking, uh, there she is. All Did right. you guys kick me out? What happened? No, Did you I just, say something? <laughs> yeah, I don't even know what we were talking about now, so, but. We were talking about advice. We were talking about people that give advice so freely now, and they're not experts at what they're giving advice on. Manifest your life. A lot of people. (laughs) Everything is is some kind of bizarre over analyzation and commercialization of spirituality and the ability to create something from nothing with no actual skill set, and that's horseshit. The actual thing is it's doing. No matter what it is that you're trying to get to, it's action. Action is the only thing that manifests shit. But they don't tell you that. They make it seem like it's whatever. And it's always advice from all these different areas. And they're giving you false hope. Or they're taking your money and they're not allowing you the ability to grow. Um, They're actually stifling it. And being someone who has the experience that you do, coming I mean, let's face it, you're the first woman influencer in, you know, the uh, in the world for for our generation Um, when it comes to the way that women pose on the Internet now and that kind of thing. You were subjected to it first. You were probably you received all of the, you know, the hate in a different format wasn't maybe comments and on Facebook, but I'm sure that there was a backlash amongst, you know, women. There was no. So there was. Yeah. There was no social media. You couldn't Google me. That's a good thing. You know? Life before Google. You know? So when I did Playboy, there was no social, there was no social media. There was no Google. So when I signed up to do Playboy, it was a magazine that you had to subscribe to that came 30 days in advance. You know, it was always, it was always a month ahead. Oh, it was that coveted rack behind the the register when you were like 13. (laughs) Or you bought it on a newsstand and it was covered. So it was. It was a different world. And then cut to all of a sudden in the in the late 90s, the Internet is getting popular now. And the two now it's like there's social media and people are posting things about me and Playboy. And I'm seeing myself You when you Googled me like 20 years ago when Google first started, however long it's been now. Mm. Has it been 20 years? I don't know, but it feels like it has. But I think it's probably been about 15 for sure. But you would Google me, and all of a sudden, my photos from Playboy would all start popping up. So I contacted Playboy, and I said, hey, just so you know, I did Playboy in 1989. There was no internet. I didn't I didn't sign up for my yeah. photos being used on the internet. I didn't sign up for that. I think I was one of maybe, maybe there were two of us that actually went to Playboy and said, Mm-mm, no, like, this is not okay. You know, sorry, we didn't, when we did Playboy, it was this, and we were done. And so they took a lot of my stuff down because it was like, I didn't, I didn't, that wasn't part of my deal. I agree and, you know, 100%. You should, you should be allowed they, to live. Yeah. Yeah. And so all of a sudden, and Hef, he sold the rights to a lot of the photos for Playboy to a lot of ex-porn sites, sites, like all those triple X sites or whatever. And so all of a sudden, all of the girls, our photos were popping up. And then once you clicked in to go into the room, we disappeared, obviously. But you were used, but being used were as being bait. Used yeah, as clickbait. As sure. bait. And I, who knows how much money, you know, Playboy was getting paid oh, for. Oh, off of your bait. likeness? I'm sure that a ton. one of the things. People That's when don't. I called and I said, hey, I don't want to be a pain, you know, but I'm going to have to be in this regard because I'm a businesswoman now. And I don't want people saying, did you do porn? 
when I did Playboy back in 1989, I didn't sign up for all the internet stuff. It totally so it was thing. a really interesting shift. That was another big shift, you know. That's got to be traumatizing yeah. to have to navigate that. It's like having your dirty laundry or what? Not even dirty laundry. It's not dirty laundry. It's just what you did at the time was your form of art well, and your expression. It, we're, we saw it play out during the election with Trump. I've never seen anything so crazy in my life on social media, people just going at each other. And it was it was really wild to watch. I thought, wow, we live in a really crazy time where so people hide behind their computer and mm. spew out this crazy stuff. And by the way, going back to aren't experts in any of it, but have Nothing. opinions. And so most of the people that were arguing with each other are not experts, but had such a strong opinion about i have a phd in google i don't wow. know what you're talking about i can google better yeah. than anybody so anybody <laughs> right so yeah you but that's the thing it's like we don't know people now but we think we do because of social media mm. we don't you know, know what they put out there. people but like, we it's like their persona that they want to put out for you know the masses but that's not who they really are you know check 700 pictures to post that one never you know they never post anything bad so people think everyone lives this perfect life and everything's great but you don't actually get to know the person at all yeah it's a painted picture it's, it's for it's, sure yeah of course and so yeah social media is a very interesting thing i i just joined an app well i joined when it came out but i never used it but i'm just starting to now because i have a book that came out last week so i go on clubhouse which is an interesting platform and so I go into rooms, you know, to promote my book. You know, if they bring me up on their stage, whatever room it is, I talk about my book. But that's another interesting platform because of my background as an actress, as a model, as a businesswoman, as an investor, and now coaching. And the people that I've been in proximity to, I get in these rooms and I hear these different, these different things happening. And I'm thinking, that's not true. <laughs> But people use that app to talk about things that are that are really not true and people follow. So yeah. it's all marketing and they market themselves mm -hmm. as an expert and you know, all of a sudden their room's popular for whatever reason and then like, oh, this is the marketing ways I should go in their room or this is the social media expert or this person is it must be a scientist if their room's full all the time and then it's really just nonsense. Yeah. And it's it's really crazy. Okay, guys, so I'm getting a notice on yeah, my computer. Yeah, I just got it too. Why don't you jump out and jump back in real quick and let's see if that does it. Okay. We'll be right here. Yay, editing. And I don't know I, if it's my computer, but I'm all set up. You're here with uh, Tech Talk in the uh, Tragedy Academy. And we're going to <laughs> check go. in it's with Gary. Tragedy. Gary, what's your bandwidth right now? It's uh, Yeah. I don't I don't use those terms. <laughs> it's like corporate mumbo jumbo. <laughs> don't do that around here. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's so crazy. So, so I don't know. Uh, let's, let's switch gears for a second. Um, I have a question. Pose it every now and then, but someone like yourself that's that you've navigated the public eye and the corporate world, I'm sure you've received a lot of hate, right? What's an insult that you've received that you take as a compliment? Ooh, that's a great question. What's an insult that I received that I take as a compliment? Internally. Well, you Maybe know, somebody said you do something. Internally. Yeah, you're you're always doing X, Y, or you come off as a, B, but you think it's a positive attribute or you take it as something that. That is a great question because I don't really pay much attention. But, you know, back in the day, 
people used to talk about my drinking, mm. which today I find to be a gift. So, you know, there's a lot of embarrassing moments in my past from drinking. Oh, same. hundred percent on the internet. There's one on the internet with TMZ that I can't take down, you know? And so, you know, I didn't even know that. Now I just look at, yeah, so good. But I look at that as a gift now where I used to be so mortified by it, but now it's a gift because that's like, I'm not that person anymore. I don't live there anymore. So how can you be happy if you hate part of yourself? You can't. It's impossible. You've got to love. You, you've you're you're love halfway loving if you halfway on. hate. You've got to love your imperfections and, you and your mistakes. Then you're halfway loving other people. Hundred percent. You're halfway loving. You're just half assed. <laughs> <laughs> We're just crumbing. <laughs> you know, get some crumbs. Hundred percent. You know? Yeah, you've got to kind of get this going before you can even have any other type of relationship. I, it's why I do a ninety day program. It's why I take people through ninety days of recovery because. I don't, it doesn't have to be alcohol, but there's, there, I have women call me frantically. I had two women who I haven't talked to in a very long time, but they know I'm a coach. I guess they're following me and reading my blogs, right? So one of them called me in a panic. I've been dating this guy for seven years and, it, you know, telling me she, for 20 minutes, telling me about the whore and I just listened. And then, it, you know, when she was done, she's like, hello, hello. <laughs> and I said, are you ready to be coached? Do you really want to be coached? Because I'm going to tell you, it's not about him. It's about you. Always will be. You know? Yeah. So if you're willing to work on this, <laughs> which most people don't want to do, Mm-mm. you're. I'm going to, I don't want to take your money because it's going to be a waste of money because you're going to be focused on him and it's not about him. And that's the, that's where most people come to me is that it's about this. It's about that. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You need to take 90 days and recover. And when you say the word recover, people kind of get scared because they think, I don't have an addiction. I don't have something. No, no, no. Yeah, you, you do. recover from you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Your you own mental condition. From you, you're in a spiral. Yeah, you're in a spiral. And the only way to really recover from a spiral or from that pain or that codependency or whatever it is you're focused on or obsessed with is to take 90 days and focus on yourself. I love and that. And it's freaking hard. I know because I did it. Over and over, I spent a year working on this program because I thought, well, if I do it and it's painful, I got to know how to take other people through it. But I did it because, you know, I've been to rehabs. I've been on lockdown. I've been 5150. I've been in all sorts of different 12 steps. I've gone to CODA. I've done all these things and I continue to do some, but there has to be something for everyone. Because there are people out there that are not going to go to a 12-step or they're not going to go to rehab, but they do need help. And they may not even know to what extent they're struggling. I didn't. Most people If I was me 12 it. years ago, yeah, if I was me 12 years ago and there was a woman speaking about a club she had and I could join and come to group coaching twice, yeah, I would have been like, sign me up. I need help. There wasn't anything like that available. I had, looks like I have to go have refresh addiction. my, I have to go out and come back. Sorry, guys. Oh, Here we go again. Be, I don't know why. This show may not survive. <laughs> Let's get it. Gary, yeah, you You're got talking, a question. We we're talking about, you know, the uh, the the fake experts and stuff like that. Um, how do you yourself like differentiate yourself from these people? You know, sometimes when you're trying to like explain to somebody that you're an expert, it actually makes you sound like you're not one. Like I have, I have that issue with, you know, dealing with media and and all the time. Like the actual experts I know, like they end up looking like they're not experts because they're trying to explain it so much. And then these other people are just have a better marketing campaign and they are perceived as the experts. How do you set yourself apart so people could actually find you or people like you as opposed to these other people that, you know, 
aren't really helping people. That's a great question. Doing it's doing these money grabs. Great question. Great segue yeah, from great earlier question, too. Because, yeah, it's it's your pitch, and the minute you start explaining and over talking, you lose people that are really the real deal. You lose those people because we know, like we know. Okay, that's and I hear this all the time on Clubhouse. That's what I'm saying. The people that are over talking and overselling, I'm like, okay. I got to hear this again. And it's the same thing. If you got to convince yourself, so you're means, not going to convince me. You don't, your bio, your referrals, your testimonials will speak for themselves. And I, I'm always good. Like you guys will get an email from me saying, if you really like something I said, could you give me a testimonial? I'll put it on my website. Because when people see those testimonials and they say, oh, you know, people really enjoyed what she had to say or whatever. I asked for testimonials. I asked for referrals. You know, in life insurance, it was it was referral based. All my business was referral based because people enjoyed working with me and they'd refer me to their friends. And I was always on people's minds when it came to insurance. Somehow or another, I'd work it into the conversation very lightly. You know, how do you spend your time? I sell insurance. I prepare people for was it something that you were insurance. passionate about? Did you feel like it gave you a way to help people? I was. I was actually really, I really liked insurance because it's something that everybody really needs, especially if you have kids and a family or if you're trying to create generational wealth. It's that one thing left in our market that's a tax-free vehicle. There's really nothing like it. So I liked insurance. I believe in it. I have it for myself. I have it for my kids if there's an unexpected life event. So I really like it and I love what it does for people. And, and, you know, we, we were the, the first brokerage that did like a world record insurance deal, which I think was 280 million. It's in the world book of Guinness records. So, you know, we, we did those and we're very involved with premium financing and all of that. So there's so many ways to use it as a tax-free vehicle. It's well, not I would argue market, so it's that one. Yeah. Yeah. I would argue that you were really really good at it because you believe in what you were putting out there. People will yeah. smell whether or not you believe what you're saying out of your own damn mouth. That's why people don't get hired. People that get hired that don't even know what the fuck the job is, is the ones that believe and walk through it and just figure it out on the way. We'll hire somebody yeah, yeah. every fucking time that believes in themselves. If yes. you believe what you're selling or what you're saying, it's going to go well if you're trying to piggyback on somebody well. else's idea and repeat it and get, you know, money off of that. You're going to fucking die out. It's not yours. Yeah. Exactly. It's not your wave to ride. Sorry. You know, you find your own. Everybody's got one. Everybody's got the capability to do unbelievable things. However, we live in fear of judgment. That's it. Simply fear of judgment. Not being accepted by others for stepping outside of a box. Yeah. It's a, it leads me to another question. You know, the 90 day, we'll call it rehab. I think rehab is like a negative connotation in certain ways because people need that. If they might not be an alcoholic or have a drug addiction, but they're just in the rut or they're like stuck in this complacency or this, this cycle. And they need that reset. Which, by the way, can be more, more challenging because you don't even know what's going That's, on. Exactly. Nope. With with an addiction, you know, if I just put yeah. this down, I might get some relief. But when you're in a rut and you don't know where it's coming from, you don't know what's triggering you, you don't know why you feel a certain way. That's, to me, why taking 90 days, it's kind of like this, guys. If you had a food allergy, the first thing the doctor's going to say to you is, well, let's remove everything out of your diet and add things back slowly so we can figure out what it is. That's kind of my whole my whole thing is like, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to remove all this. We're going to add the good stuff. And that way I can figure out what in your life is the trigger, where the rut is. You know, when was the last time you opened the hood and checked to see what was really going on? Where are People you? Don't. Right. Where are you running out of gas? That means and you so, have to look at it. You're terrified to look under the hood. That's what nobody will yeah. say. We're all terrified yeah. collectively to look under the hood. And if we and get caught a, looking under the hood, somebody else might think that we're slacking, but we're not as good as them. Or they might just be able to have the opinion that we don't. We don't want anybody there's so knowing. There's so much freedom. There's so much freedom. Oh, yeah. if, that's what I tell people. If you're willing to surrender and go through 90 days of just putting it all aside, 
Like, let it all go for 90 days. I guarantee there's freedom on the other side because all of a sudden you really do get to know yourself. You get to know what's going on with you. It's like a hamster on a wheel in a field, Mm -hmm. not knowing Mm -hmm. that it had free range capabilities and continues to run in the same spot. Exactly. And I believe it. I did this for decades. So I get it. Same. That's why I'm like, just do, do this deal. That's why I said to this girl, you say, think about this, the insanity of getting a phone call when somebody says, I've been doing this for seven years and they're hysterical. And I'm thinking my first thought is seven years. <laughs> like Today, seven months would be like crazy, but seven years of just being on that wheel, like you said. And I thought seven years of being miserable and being like codependent with somebody. And, and then, you know, and then the, the, the rationale, well, I'll miss them and I'll miss our friendship. Really? Hell of a friendship. So I always equate like it to this? food. If it, if something tasted bad, would you continue to eat it? No. <laughs> really truffles. Good Lord. No, you stop. Don't show me capers. Don't put them on my food. I don't like them. And it's the same thing. No. (laughs) But, you know, she's wanting to figure out how to go back. She's having nostalgia with capers. You can't do that. Exactly. You can't. Don't romance your capers. That's my new shirt. Horrible texture. They got to (laughs) go. That's probably never even good either. In most anyway, I'm that coach. So just so you know, and I'm like that coach where unless you're willing to surrender and be coachable, we're not a match. I'm not going to take somebody's money just because I think it's like a great thing. Like I'm the the exception of coaches. I'm like, if you're there's your differentiator. Yeah, if you're willing to do the deal, we can work together. Otherwise, no. People are only only ready when they're ready. I only take, and by the way, I only take a handful of one-on-one clients because it's a lot of work. You know, these people that have more than five clients, then I'm not quite sure what the quality is there because I really, like, it's, I'm with my clients along the way. That's a a coach at that point, right? Or a mentor. If you're only down to like, if you've got 10, 15 people that you're supposedly changing the lives of all at once, somebody's getting ripped off. Yeah. It's probably you I first think... and then everybody else. Your family yeah. is already sucking because you're not with them. And then on well, top of that, I everybody started... else is getting a teaspoon. This is why I started my club because I thought, what a great way I can come on like this twice a month. People can come and go as they please, pay a monthly fee, and they have group coaching twice a month. Whether they show up or not, that's their decision. But I'm there and I can coach several people. And if way, you build I, it, they will come when exactly, they're ready. Exactly. So that's that's kind of that that actually brings me a lot more like I get a lot out of that because there's a lot of people that hop on that don't want to do one on one, but they just want to listen in. Do you remember the TV show uh, Quantum Leap? I never watched that show. You didn't. Scott Bakula. Mm-hmm. He would pop up in people's lives at various points to help them through some kind of event or trauma or change something for whatever the good. Um, And I feel like, and it was always random. And I feel like that should be how we approach our delivery of what we think is our message to the masses. Whatever it is that we think our passion is to give away on the road of life to try to get, you know, people to be successful or happy or whatever it is that they're trying to do that we just, I I kind of forgot where I'm even going with it, but no, but it's like, it's somebody appearing in your life right when they need it. You have a crossroads. And if you, if you're not there to force them into submission at any point, it will be easy when they're ready because they're going to come to you or they're going to cross your path when they're on their knees, not a year before. Not, you know, you'll recognize it, but that's, you're on that level already. You have a lens in your Benjamin Franklin bifocals that this person doesn't have yet. So you can see that with that green filter that they've got fucking a shirt on that says, I love vodka. Nobody else can see it. Yeah. And it's great when you have that lens. That's why I tell everybody, you want to get clear. You want to get clarity. You want to understand why you feel a certain way. You need to remove yourself from everything for 90 days because you're never gonna you're never gonna understand that clarity you're going to have unless you do it. Why 90 days? So there's a lot of people listening going, why 90 days? 
Well, to, to, to break or get a new habit, our body, our mind has to get used to it. We can't just wake up one day and go, oh, you know what? I'm going to be gluten-free. And, I, you know, it takes a while for our system and our habit to change, right? Right around 30 days, we're like, okay, I'm seeing the benefits. It doesn't happen right away. We don't see benefits after 30 days of doing something. It's usually right around 90 days where we go, wow, now I see the change. Now I see why I kept doing that consistently. And by the way, during those 90 days, I may have fell back a week and ate something with gluten, but I realized it didn't work and got right back on my program. And so there's a reason why with any habit, we need no less than 30, but 90 to make it stick. A merry-go-round has to stop before it can go the other way. You need to sit there. You cannot be spinning one direction and expect to go the other without coming to some point where you've stopped and analyzed yourself and pushed it the other direction. So you have to have that window where you deconstruct. If you had a merry-go-round spinning, it takes a while for it to stop. It doesn't just stop unless you put a stick in the spoke of the tires, which is all well and good. That's called the pandemic. That's what it did to everybody. It's like fucking wham, bam, here you come. You're all wham, creators now. Bam. Everybody, yeah. you either we on were... your knees or you Boom. were fucking losing your shit. We right? were locked. Think about this. We were locked down. Beautiful. Like the whole world was locked down. Who would have ever thought? I never thought in my lifetime I would see something that. That's that was some crazy. fucking like late night movie shit that my dad it's would the watch. Best thing that ever happened to me. Yeah. I, Same. I did basically the ninety day thing for longer, but I mean, I yeah. It was let me tell you, it changed and... my life too. I, I, I wrote a book. I wrote two books. I wrote a chapter in somebody else's book. I started writing a weekly blog. It brought out. I all of a sudden I was like, this was what I was meant to do. There it because is. Because my insurance business took a dive. Because who wanted to buy insurance during COVID? Nobody. <laughs> Absolutely not. Not. When the, not when not when the news is telling everybody that when it first when we first went on lockdown, the news was saying, if you're 65 and older, boy, you are at risk. You will you're die. Not. Well, guess what? Those were my clients. You're telling I stopped my watching this? all forms of media. Yeah. So now my, our business completely went to a halt. I live in California where everything went cuckoo and our office was closed for over a year. I had to reinvent. I sat here and wrote a book. So tell us about The Son of Basque. Yep. Son of a Basque is a historical novel based on my grandfather's life. My grandfather wrote this book over 40 years ago. It was sitting in a box. These typed papers was sitting in a box. In 2017, when my grandmother was dying, I went to Florida to be with her. And when we were cleaning out her house, I found this box in the garage. And I opened it and I was like, well, this looks kind of important. I'm going to ship this back to California. And I did. And then it sat here for two years. And in 2019, I opened it up and I started pulling it out and reading and kind of putting it together. And I was like, wait a minute, what? I, it was the most profound feeling I've ever had because I thought he wrote this over 40 years ago in the 80s. I didn't know half the things that he wrote about. I didn't know that his father died when he was 10 years old. I didn't know that his dad was a famous bullfighter. His I didn't sister know died his, in a well. His sister died in a well. Uh. He lost his dad and his sister in the same year, and he became the man of the house. And, and an indentured going, servant. Yeah. An indentured servant in a beef. I bought the book. It's beautiful. Um, Thank you. I, I think that it, it, one of the things that we don't discuss enough, you know, we have placed this thing on past lives where it's some kind of spiritual BS. Um, where it's something that is out of the realm of our lives. It's something that's, you know, in left, left field. But in all actuality, when you say Basque, that is one of the most torn areas and oppressed places on the planet from the time yes. where he's coming from. Because we had Andrew Nethery. He's a director that did a documentary on the uh, the Basque people in Catalonia, and it was called Bury Us, and it was a punk rock uprising because oh, wow. they're a group of people there that embrace the Basque culture and the native 
uh, language, and they've been expressing it through punk rock. And he did a whole documentary on it. And it echoes with me because your grandfather's traumas and life experiences will come out in his children and his children's children. That's what we pass on. You well, know, those traits I, that we that's... have from those experiences, those are huge traumatic experiences that they yes. imprint on our DNA. They create Absolutely. new features. And then we give those to our kids. That's why it's so important to look back and see where we come from, if we can, so that we well, can get some kind of explanation as to what constructed us. It's it's a roadmap. History leaves clues. And I what it got me on such a mission. I was reading this and I was thinking, wow, that explains so much, you know, because his kid suffers so much trauma from, you know, listen, he was in the World War II. He meets my grandmother. She's 17. She's a war bride. Her parents had died. She was raised by her grandparents. They unbelievably stayed married for over 50 years, which was incredible, but they had no clue how to raise kids. And so there, so now my mother, who's the daughter, she was the firstborn, has me. And so, you know, when people say things like, I just don't know why I feel this way. I love that because that means something that happened energy wise is affecting you that you absolutely had nothing to do with. And my grandfather suffered a lot of trauma. If you have the book, you, you, you can see at a very young age, mm. he immediately went on all this trauma and then three wars, prison guard. He was always a servant. He was always of service. And it made me realize that, you know, we go to the doctor, we fill out medical forms, and they always ask us about our medical history, cancer, heart, diabetes. What they should be saying, was there post-traumatic syndrome? Was there molestation? Mm. Was there rape? Was there anxiety? Was there depression? Did, was there suicide in your family? Was there this? Because those are the things that really create disease. And, mm. and I look at that now. I think, wow, my grandfather, you know, he had a lot of disease towards the end of his life. He was an untreated post-traumatic, post-trauma syndrome. He was the perfect example of somebody who had the shakes and was riddled with fear. And he was always jumping out of his skin. And, so you know, I was very close with him growing up because I was the first grandchild. And my mother was the only, you know, she was their daughter. And then I was born. I was, I was you know, they loved me and adored me. I stayed at their house every weekend. But I saw him in a completely different way as a grandchild than what I read in the book. And it was completely profound. And it put me on a mission now to write my book. Because think about for generations to come, my kids, their kids, and their kids' kids are now going to have this book, Son of a Basque, that they can read about a great grand, great great grandfather that they never got to meet, but now they can read about his life and his journey. I think that it gives me the chills. It's so profound. It's it's rare it's so to have necessary. that in this day and yes. age because so, the majority rare. of America is is cultureless um, yes. in this day and age. We have no roots anymore. We've diluted it to the point where we don't know anything about who we are. We've tried to cancel everything out. We have no individuality anymore. Um, and I think things like that allow us to reconnect. Yeah, and I get really tired of that canceling out stuff. It's like all these things that get taken down and we, they want to take out of history books and this and that. It's like, no, history leaves clues. Even bad things are going to happen in the world. Horrible things, disgraceful things. But we, but we have to learn from it. We can't delete it. We can't erase it. We have to keep learning from it as we grow. Don't pay it homage. You know? Put it in a museum. Move forward. Exactly. Simple as that. Yeah, yeah. not talking about it. But it's the to, wrong to answer. try to delete it and not talk about it and and you know, it's it's wild what's gone on in history. We we treat our past discretions like a litter box, kicking shit over them so nobody can see it, even though it's a mound yeah. still there that everybody knows is there. That's the ridiculous it's part. Yeah. Like we know that it's sitting there under the litter. <laughs> I'm gonna fucking acknowledge it. We're all gonna play this game where nobody looks below their nose, right? Yeah. It's so stupid. We're I don't know. I, I just I wanted to tell you that um, I, I thought it was a beautiful book. I thought Thank the you. opportunity to be able to to delve into your family lineage and see those things in real life, you know. And one of the things that was pointing out to me recently was that as a child we are 
self-centric. We only know what we know about ourselves, and then our parents are our God. And all of our interpretations are only through that lens. So your grandfather is one of the gods. Your parents are one of the gods. For that first five to ten years of life before whatever the hell slaps us out of that fuzz or whatever it is. So those viewpoints are 100% going to be different than what you read in there. And to be able to look at how he treated you and whatever, you know, restraint or happiness or ways that he, you know, portrayed himself to you through your relationship, you get to see the strength in that as well. I feel like when you can look behind the curtain and see what somebody's been through and then say, well, geez, you don't look like anything's wrong. Then you realize just how strong somebody actually is. Yes. And that's what this book did for me. That's you couldn't have said it better. That's what this book did. When I started reading it and putting it together and connecting the dots and a lot of parts were missing. So that's where I came in. I, I tried to keep it as authentic to what he had left, but I had to rewrite and some of the characters didn't match up throughout the through line. And so I did a lot of rewrite. And because of that, that's where it would hit like the, the the biggest part in the book for me, the part where I literally just sat and cried was when he had pneumonia and he was in the infirmary during World War II. Mm. It was he served over 25 missions as a tail gunner. And the one mission that he was in the infirmary with pneumonia, his whole crew, all his buddies were shot down. And I literally like put it down. That's PTSD. And took that moment. Like I can get, I can get really emotional. Just Survivor's about this Because I was, because he really, really loved those guys. And then in one swell, and then, you know, there's always that guilt of like, if I would have been there, maybe it wouldn't have happened. And I just, I just got the chills. I was like, I didn't know that story. And well, I couldn't imagine having had that kind of Had he been bond. there, you wouldn't be writing his story now. And yeah. other people wouldn't be benefiting from the strength of his perseverance, his story, and that lineage because you have a fucking tough ass family. Like you come from badasses. When I'm reading that, I'm like, wow, you know, people cry about not having two TVs. And, you know, you look back on a childhood that your grandfather went through and you're like, holy shit. Like, yeah, the, the location. So, so much more resilient. So much more, like, didn't expect anything. Like, just, I love the, just the the beginning where he hops on a train and he's like a hobo on a train. Like, just no money, no food, freezing You know what cold. I loved in the beginning of that was when he was faced with being told to go back to the Latino school where he yes. was being bullied, beat up. He saw his sisters getting, you yeah. know, attacked, all this stuff. And when they came to try to you know, get him for truancy for not being at that school. He said, I'll go back, but only if you send me to the Anglo school. Yeah. And that's how he was when he joined the Air Corps too. He was very persistent about, you know, because he, he didn't speak such great English. They wanted to put him in the service of like, you'll work in the kitchen or you'll mop the floors. And he was like, no, I want to fight in the war, you know, and he was persistent with that too. And I read that and I was like, oh my God, you know, and it's it's so funny for me now in the life that I have, because I used to like just get the biggest kick out of the fact that I had a grandfather who spoke Spanish, you know, and I went to a private kindergarten school and my grandfather, when I was in kindergarten, owned a donut shop in Torrance. I wish I could remember the name of it right now, but it was kind of right in the Rolling Hills Torrance area. And he had a donut shop and my whole kindergarten class got to go on a field trip to the donut shop and he showed everybody how donuts were made. And I kept saying, speak Spanish, speak Spanish, because we were <laughs> learning Spanish right? in kindergarten and, you know, rojo. And I, for some reason, came naturally, I could roll my R's. And, and so we were learning Spanish and I just felt like, forget the donuts, speak Spanish. Speak you were Spanish. so proud. And I, I was so proud of him. And and he also drove an ice cream truck. In oh, you're the coolest kid in the world. Uh, like, can you your, imagine? Your grandfather All worked in the friends. donut shop and the ice cream truck? Yeah. I was like, I was very popular. <laughs> As a kindergarten or first grader. I was like, as you get. Like, Jackie's grandfather's get. got the donut shop and the ice cream truck. You know, it's like, oh my God. 
Well, but, you know, and I think back, like, that's what he did. He loved that. He loved community. He loved service. He loved, you know, when the Korean War broke out, he was the first to go and go serve. When Vietnam broke out, he was the first to go. He didn't fight in Vietnam, but he was there. And what was he doing? He was having my grandmother and my mother send clothes for the kids over there that had nothing. You know, I think this is a great place to end because that's a message that we all should listen to. And I think you should know that he would be very proud of you and that you were doing exactly what he did by giving back to others unconditionally. You're being yourself and you're trying to affect change. And I myself appreciate it greatly. And I know that all of our listeners will appreciate it as well. Um, I, I can't thank you enough for, um, for being so raw and open about your life so other people can grow from it. Gary, do you have any questions? It's not Randy's Donuts, is it? No. Okay. <laughs> I have to go no, to place it, Torrance Randy's Randy's Donuts is in L.A. We were yeah. in Rolling Hills near PCH, near uh, um, Crenshaw. In that neighborhood. And, I, you know, I've asked several people if they could remember in my family. And no, but we, can't, we just can't. I don't know why, but we're all blanking out on it. But I'm sure if I did a ton of research, I could find it. But, yeah. That's super yeah, cool. It might have been Arietta's Donuts for all I know. <laughs> <laughs> it might have been just that simple. It's like, where's the salt? You know, it's right in front of you. Absolutely. Well, anyway, do you want to tell everybody? So yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I just want to say thank you so much. I am filled with gratitude anytime that I get to share my story or, you know, the book or spend time with you. And it's it just fills me up. So I really appreciate it. And I thank you so much. And yeah, if you if it, you want to come on a journey with me, the best way to do that is to go to my website. My website is filled with information. It has all my social media links. Um, if you subscribe to my newsletter, if you're listening to this and you subscribe to my newsletter, I'll send you a book. I want you to have this book. So I'll send you a copy of the book. If I get a news, just all you have to do is reference, I heard you on the Tragedy Academy and I'll send you a free book. Well, thank you Sorry. so much. I, yeah. I encourage it. Definitely encourage it. Yeah. So I'd love to do that. I'd love to give give back. I'm trying to figure out how I can get this book in the hands of as many vets as I can. So I'm working on that right now. And I also want to get it into prisons because I think it's such a great adventure for uh, anybody who's in prison suffering. These are the kind of books that I would hope that they would have there for and them. So strength I'm working from... on that. Yeah. So yeah, my website is DebraDriggs.com and subscribe. You'll get a weekly blog, personal letter from me. It's not, you know, a robot. It's me. I actually email everybody that sub subscribes to my newsletter, believe it or not. People... Have, we've become a family. You know, people will send me, you know, an email saying, I read your blog this week and it meant so much. And I, that's the best feedback I can get. 100%. Right. And so I, I encourage that. I want to hear from you. So, well, we yeah, encourage it again. as well. Um, join Deborah on her healing path. And uh, remember, everybody, be cool and keep learning. What's up, academics? This is Jay. I'm here to talk to you about Into the AM. This is a clothing and apparel company that I came across last year that has the absolute coolest designs. And the reason why I was attracted to it is because I grew up without a lot of money, like many others, and had to shop on that outlet rack with the irregular items. Things like the fly was over four inches to the left, or the right sleeve would be twice the size of the left. It looked like I was growing horizontally. Like, it's okay, honey, you'll grow into your left arm. So you really don't get a chance to express yourself the way that you want to. You go into life, you start putting on suits, you start putting on uniforms, and you realize you'd never had a chance to truly express yourself. Enter into the AM, a team of artists and creators who share a common vision. They see clothing as a canvas to express what drives you. Since 2012, They've developed premium apparel that elevates self-expression and provides unparalleled comfort for wherever your passions take you. Into the AM's passion for change is the driving force behind their brand. They remain committed to creating products that inspire and promote self-expression by partnering with like-minded organizations focused on giving back to communities in need. Last year, they donated 1% of all revenue from their graphic tees collection to the Art of Elysium charity. 
The Art of Elysium is an artist organization built on the idea that through service, art becomes a catalyst for social change. For over 24 years, The Art of Elysium has paired volunteer artists with communities to support individuals in the midst of difficult emotional life changes. They currently offer 110 community programs per month, serving over 30,000 individuals per year. The only permanent thing in life is change. Supporting charities dedicated to helping those going through these changes, trials, and tribulations require a never-ending commitment. The onus is on us as creators to affect change through our true, authentic talents, and Into the AM is the model of how this is done. Their clothes are handcrafted with care. They have a team of skilled artisans that craft each garment with the highest quality fabrics and eco-friendly inks. Not to mention, these things don't shrink, they don't fade, and they fit as if they were designed supernaturally. I'm stopped every time I wear one of the graphic tees to find out where I got it. The colors attract attention from miles, and the art is nothing short of spectacular, with designs for everyone. One of my personal favorites, Twilight Maiden. Go take a look. End of the AM does all of this while putting their money where their mouth is. 30-day money-back guarantee, lightning-fast shipping, and hassle-free returns. The deals are endless. Graphic tee bundles, discount promo codes. Get over there. Check it out. I'm highlighting the tees, but I'd be remiss to not mention that if you want to walk around in the absolute most comfortable shorts, joggers, and basic tees, hit up into the end. I even wear the basics to the gym. Head on over to thetragedyacademy.com, go to our sponsors tab, and follow the affiliate link to the Into the AM store. Help support Into the AM and the Tragedy Academy by purchasing the absolute best apparel and the best designs ever. And remember, academics, be cool and keep learning.